hello everybody and then welcome to this FIG online series and my name is Jani Tanskanen I am from the FIG Education Commission and today's interesting topic is a visual perception of complex movements and I would like to to welcome our expert Alexandra Pizzera to join us and also our guest Fabian Hambuchen. Hello from Cologne. Hello everybody. So to give the short introduction of Alexandra, she is one of the FIG experts in coaching education and currently an academic within the Institute of Psychology at the German Sport Institute in Cologne. Her main research interests are in judgment and decision making of sports officials, focusing on different factors influencing their performance, as well as the selection, training and performance evaluation of sports officials. She also examines the area of visual perception and embodied cognition, examining and transferring the bidirectional link between perception and action in and to sports office dating, athletes and coaches. So welcome again, Alexandra. Thank you very much. And then to introduce our guest who doesn't actually need much introduction in the world of gymnastics. He had an extremely long and successful career as a high level athlete. He has won more 25 medals in uh, global continental major championships and all culminating in his Olympic success where he reached the Olympic final in high bar four times in a row and has plus of medals each one of each color and it, it culminated his uh, dream come true in final Olympic Games and finishing her career with the Olympic gold medal in Rio. So welcome Fabian Hambuchen. Thanks Yanni, really appreciate it. So first we shall have the presentation from Alexandra and after the presentation we shall have an interesting chat, all three of us around the topic. So I hand it over to you Alexandra, the floor is yours. Welcome to the lecture of the visual perception of complex movements. Perception is the process of gathering information through our senses, organizing, identifying and interpreting them. Perception is therefore the part of the process of understanding our environment. In order to understand our environment, we have different senses that are available, available to us such as the kinesthetic sense, the visual sense, the auditory, olfactory and gustatory sense. <clears throat> in this lecture, I will focus on the visual sense, which is our most prominent sense. Visual perception in sport is the process of picking up environmental information, which instills form for example, of objects, surfaces, events, and patterns within a perceiver. In most everyday actions, eye movements and whole body movements or movements of body segments are thought to be spatially and functionally related. So the eyes look towards relevant objects and locations, and this information is used to guide the corresponding action. So for example, if I see a cup of coffee, I move my hands towards this cup of coffee to pick it up. In sports, however, visual information is used for actions, but also for cognitive processes. For example, one can distinguish between three groups of people who perceive. The athlete, or in our case, the gymnast, the coach, and the judge. These groups of people use visual perception for very different functions. The gymnast, uses visual perception in order to act, so learning and performing skills. The coach uses visual information also to act, however, in this case, in order to spot the gymnast tool, so to provide manual guidance, but also in terms of cognitive processes to give feedback, for example. The judge uses visual perception for cognition um, in order to make judgments.
But how do we know that a person is using optical information? We know this by looking at attention. So if attention is directed to a specific location, then we know that the person is using this visual information. In addition, we can distinguish between fixation and saccades. Fixation is when the gaze is held on an object or location within three degrees of visual angle for 100 milliseconds or longer. This is the minimum amount of the time needed to recognize or become aware of stimuli. Saccades, on the other hand, are when the eyes move quickly from one fixated or tracked location to another. This then does not permit conscious information processing. So it is impossible to make an eye movement without a shift in attention, giving us exactly this indication if a person is actually using visual information. So let's first focus on the athlete or the gymnast after going through to the coach and the judge. If we look at these highly dynamic and complex environments such in, as in gymnastics, how do skilled athletes actually perceive visual information in order to perform such exquisitely timed and consistent actions? because they use visual selective attention. So they direct their visual attention to environmental information, cues, that then influence the preparation and or the performance of an action. This so-called gaze control differs depending on the type of task because visual attention is highly task specific. And I will give an example for each of the following three gaze control categories throughout the next slides. We can distinguish between targeting tasks, interceptive timing tasks, and tactical. Are, for example, the basketball free throw. So the basketball player focuses on the target, the basket, in order to successfully throw the ball into the basket. And several studies have nicely demonstrated that experts have longer final fixation durations, so the last fixation before the hand starts to move, than, than novices. And these experts also have a longer final fixation duration for shots they made, so hits, compared to when they missed. This long final fixation duration has been termed the quiet eye. Now, what about gymnastics? Where do we find this kind of targeting tasks? A little different because we don't move objects like a ball. However, we move ourselves and target the bars, for example, as seen here in this example. Interceptive timing tasks involve the processing of dynamic visual information in order to catch an object while moving. So in this example seen here, the catcher in baseball needs to run in a way that the angle between the horizontal and the link between the catcher and the ball remains constant. This is the so-called angle of elevation. So the person must adapt his or her running velocity according to the visual information. Now, where do we find this example in gymnastics? If we look at the coach. So the coach also needs to adapt his or her movements according to the visual information, in this case, the flying gymnast, in order to be there at the correct spot at the correct time to provide manual guidance. The third category are tactical tasks, so gaze control during locomotion. And an example is our vault. So running up towards the springboard 
visually perceiving the spot where I need to land with my feet in order to get as most energy as possible. Then again, visually perceiving the vault in order to place my hand at the correct spot. Flying through the air and again, visually perceiving a spot somewhere at the wall in order to prepare my landing and control my landing. So what about the relationship between gaze behavior and movement goals in complex skills incorporating flight phases and rotations about one or more body axes? So looking at complex aerial skills. During her tumbling, Bael says that the only thing she sees is the colors of the ceiling and the floor whizzing past in revolving blurs. So when she vaults, basically, she sees nothing at all. Some elite gymnasts count to themselves while flying through the air to keep track of where they are. It has been speculated that the information extracted from the visual system is primarily used to provide the athlete with information to control the landing of aerial movements. So additionally, it is thought that this might result from a prospective type of control of body orientation, orientation during the flight phase. So let's come back to the question how skilled athletes perceive visual information. In order to perform such exquisitely timed and consistent actions, such as in somersaults, do they use optical information to control their movements? And what actually is meant with controlling movements. Let's take the example of the back tuck somersault. And there have been nice studies on the visual control in aerial skills. In this example by Rezet and Abla, 1985, they compared the timing, joint angles, joint angular velocities between conditions with and without vision. So what they have shown is that visual motion cues mainly seem to control the imbalance of landing, whereas visual orientation cues, the only ones probably available in more complex um, rotation aerial skills, these orientation cues are used in the backward somersault to estimate the orientation of the body. In the case of more complex leaps, like full backward twisting, Visual orientation cues are less easily used and probably replaced by vestibular equivalent cues. Let's use another example from the vault, specifically the front handspring. Heinen and colleagues did a nice study where the aim was to examine if the position of a springboard is used as an information source in the regulation of the handspring on the vault. So what actually happens if I move the springboard further away from the vaulting table or nearer to the vaulting table? And if I manipulate this information, does this change the movement during the front handspring? And this may then provide us with the information whether gymnasts use this visual information of the springboard location for their movements. So in this study, 14 female expert gymnasts performed front hand springs on the vault while the position of the springboard was manipulated. The results showed that gymnasts placed their feet on average in the same position on the springboard and adapted to the springboard position during the last three steps of the approach run. So a smaller distance of the springboard to the table of only 10 centimeters resulted in a different hand placement on the table. Specifically, there was a smaller distance of the hands during the support phase to the end of the vaulting table, which in turn led to a shorter first flight phase and a takeoff angle closer to 90 degrees and ultimately to a longer second flight phase. So it seems that the gymnasts somehow use this information of the location of the springboard because they always landed 
in about the same position on that springboard, regardless of the springboard being closer or further away to the table. However, the whole movement changed because of this adjustment. Practical implications could be that a shorter distance of the springboard to the front edge of the vaulting table can result in better handspring performances. Therefore, it may be appropriate to shorten the springboard distance if the aim is to optimize the handspring temporarily. However, it could also be possible that after several attempts with a shorter springboard distance, the athlete adapts to the new springboard distance, falling back into the movement pattern suitable for the normal springboard distance. So now that we know that visual information is used by gymnasts in order to control their movements, how can we use this knowledge to support action changes within the learning process from the perspective of a coach? The coach has basically three options to manipulate perceptual information in the environment during skill acquisition. A, he can increase or she can increase the sensitivity to other potentially useful sources of information, for example, to haptic, proprioceptive or auditory information. The second option is that he or she can direct attention to key sources of visual information for learners, for example, with mirrors, pictures, or using videos of performance. Or the third option is that he or she can direct away from visual cues to become less reliant on the central vision for steering, orienting, and guiding movements. In the following slides, I will focus on the second option to direct attention to key sources of visual information for learners. So how exactly is this done to direct visual attention towards specific cues? And again, I would like to stay, take a study as an example, which was done by Heinen and Jirai and colleagues um, in 2012. Um, to give an example. So the aim was in the study to investigate the relationship between gaze behavior and movement behavior during the backward somersault or salto dismount from the uneven bars. And the task was of 13 expert gymnasts to fixate a light spot on the landing mat during the downswing phase. So basically directing visual attention was done by using a light spot and the gymnasts had to look at this light spot and the location of this light spot varied systematically and the aim was to find out how the movement then so the salto dismount of the from the uneven bars actually changes with respect to these variations of the light spot they had to fixate So what you can see here is a stick figure sequence of a gymnast performing a salto dismount from the uneven bars. And in the study, the individual landing location of each gymnast was first determined. So usually each gymnast has a typical landing location. And in this case, then the distance from the bar was determined for each gymnast. To manipulate the light spot, this light spot was always set 15 centimeters or 30 centimeters nearer to the bar from the individual landing distance or 15 and 30 centimeters further away. So during the downswing phase, the gymnasts were asked to fixate on these different spots that were shown with the light spot. The results showed that as a function of the light spot location, there were variations in the hip angle at the top of the backswing, the duration of the downswing phase, the hip angle prior to kick through, and the landing distance. 
Specifically, as an example, the landing distance was shorter in the minus 30 and the minus 15 centimeter condition and longer in the 15 plus 15 and plus 30 centimeter condition compared to baseline where the light spot was not manipulated. So to conclude, gaze fixation towards the landing mat seemed to have served skill execution concerning a particular landing location. As a summary, one can say that reaching a particular landing location is a result of the flight phase itself, which in turn is a result of the takeoff conditions when performing the dismount. And these mechanical conditions of the takeoff are a result of the swing motion, which again in turn is driven by the gaze direction during the swing motion. So if you want your gymnast to increase landing distance, for example, and tell the gymnast to land further away from the bar, she might not know how to realize this. However, directing her gaze to a landing spot further away might automatically result in a larger landing distance. So this just as an example of what kind of um, various feedback options a coach can have and how to implement even more this focus or focus of attention, so directing attention to key sources of visual information. To sum it all up now, visual perception in sport and in particular in gymnastics is important for the gymnast, the coach and the judge. All three groups of people can make use of visual selective attention for action as well as cognitive processes. Visual attention, as we have heard, is highly task specific, therefore gaze control differs depending on the type of task, so a targeting task, an interceptive timing task or a tactical task. As possible gaze strategies, athletes and also coaches have been shown to use the quiet eye, for example, or the angle of elevation. In more complex skills, such as aerial skills and gymnastics, visual perception is used for controlling movements, but also for body orientation. The coach can play an important role in helping to direct athletes' attention during the learning process, because gymnasts learning new skills are at first unable to interpret information from limb displacements, velocities or accelerations on the basis of proprioception alone. This way, the learning process, also including manual guidance of coaches, can help to be planned and organized in a more efficient way. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much, Alexandra, for extremely informative and then very, very interesting presentation on today's topic. Now I would like to, to ask Fabian to join us again. Thank you, Yanni. So my question, Fabian, a little bit general, what do you feel about this topic and then your experiences as a gymnast and your training processes, learning complex skills or competition preparation? Yeah, it's a really interesting topic for me, especially because I was not just using visualization in gymnastics training in general, I also used it a lot in my mental training. So it's a really big part uh, of the whole career, just working on the visualization in, uh, in different, uh, yeah, in different actions. Thank you. I, I'm sure that is the case. And I, I still have some memories from my own career relating to you. But let's have Alexandra to ask you some questions, because as a researcher and academic, it, it must be interesting to have such a high profile example or specimen at your hands. So what kind of questions do you have for, for Fabian? Yes, thank you. And I'm very happy to ha finally have this opportunity to ask such an expert about what I'm basically 
be researching in the lab mostly, but of course also examining some uh, gymnasts. And for me, it would be really interesting to know if you think about uh, specific skills in gymnastics, um, do you actually know where you look at while you do a back tuck somersault, for example, or even twisting? Do you have specific spots where you know this is where I look at? Or do you mostly do this subconsciously or maybe even with your eyes closed? Or do you don't know at all? No, I was one. Oh, wait, we stopped a little bit. I was too fast <laughs> to answer. I always knew where I am in the air while twisting and doing my somersaults and stuff. I had a really, really good uh, coordination because we worked a lot on a trampoline when I was really young or still till the end, I was working a, a lot on a trampoline. We always did like kind of these sticking contests of uh, one somersault with a half twist, with full twist, double backflip and whatever. We did crazy skills and always tried to land perfectly. So um, at this time, we learned to figure out where to find the spot to orientate on. Um, but it was always the floor at the end. It was never the roof. That was one really uh, important fact to, to concentrate on. And I was working with a, with a trampoline coach as well because I had an injury when I was really young on my elbow and I, nobody knew if I can continue with gymnastics. So he already offered his, uh, his support that I can continue with trampoline if I'm not doing gymnastics. So he told me that they always are just uh, focusing on the, on the trampoline, so just on the floor. And that helped me a lot to, to figure that out. And what I did, uh, but I didn't uh, train it like this, but what I did was whenever I knew I cannot see anything, I closed my eyes. So when I was doing like a, a double somersault through the air, and at this time where my head was like going, going up, I closed my eyes because I knew I, I can't see anything. I always just opened my eyes when I knew I can look to the floor, I can look to the bar and see something. So that was really interesting, but I didn't train that. It was just uh, automatically, um, but we worked a lot with that. That's really interesting. And I, I think it has to do with, like you said, the position and the speed of the movement as well. When you think about the layout double with the full twist from high bar, you can see the crown all the time. But if you make a triple twist, I don't know if you close your eyes or you just don't see anything until the moment you spot the, the ground or the mat. Yes, it's exactly how you how you said it. It's like when I when I did the casino on high bar, I knew I have the chance always to look down. So then I had my eyes opened all the time. But when I do a triple twist or a triple backflip, every time I, I knew that I can't see the floor, I didn't open my eyes. I just opened it at the end. But my but my feeling, my coordination was so good. I always knew where I am in the air. So even if uh, I felt like, okay, I have not enough rotation or I was a little bit slow, I still didn't open my eyes <laughs> till the end, but I felt uh, where I am exactly in the air so um, that I could uh, improve a little bit uh, with my body, with everything else uh, during the skill. So I would like to hand it over the opportunity for Alexandra to ask some more questions from, from, from our guest. Yes, that's very interesting as an answer and hasn't really been looked at so much in uh, research that you actually purposefully close your eyes and know by your probably other senses where you are, because usually what you would say in the learning process is actually open your eyes and check out where you are, because what you say is actually I would say at a higher level, you already know where you are, so you don't need your eyes, at least for that part where you can't see anything anyway. Um, and it's interesting that you actually mentioned uh, to go to the trampoline first and there learn the um, eye movements, which you then maybe transfer to gymnastics where you have less time to learn such gaze behavior because you're in the air a little less longer. Is that what you you think it is that you learn it on the trampoline because you have a little more time? Exactly. This is the big advantage. You have a lot of time to see the floor, to have the, yeah, the right timing, when to twist. And when this is getting automatically, you can, you can go on the gymnastics pieces to do it in a really uh, fast uh, uh, velocity. 
But um, I think that's still a big problem in gymnastics that coaches don't use trampoline so much. So we, or my dad, who was my coach, he understood this really, really early. And he had uh, good coaches talking to like, like from Russia or from, from Japan. He, he lived in Japan for one and a half years in the 70s. So he, he learned a lot from that. And uh, when I started with gymnastics, the first thing what every kid loves to do is like going on the trampoline and just jumping around, jumping into the pit and stuff. So um, I started really early with that and did a lot of skills on a trampoline and learned to get a better coordination for that. And also what I said in the beginning in my, in my mental training, we also did a lot of visualization of course of the, of the movements how how i how i have to feel in the air how i have to feel the bar it's also kind of a rhythm for example we always worked a lot with a uh, with a biomechanic and um yanni knows him he's a former uh former olympic gymnast from finland mauno nissinen we worked a lot with him so after every attempt on the event i went over to him he was filming it with the camera and we watched it on the screen and uh, compared like my feeling and how it looked like and what was wrong, what was right. How did I feel that it is getting better? Um, and also in Rio at my last Olympic games, we worked with that technique a lot. So we had like six days, no competition between the team final and the high bar final. And every time in training, I went down from the high bar. I went into a corner, just closed my eyes, try to reproduce the feeling. How did it feel to do the skill on the high bar? And then I went over to my dad and we compared. This was how it felt and that was the result. And we worked a lot with that so that I just has to focus on the feeling at the end. So that I can try to reduce all the disturbing factors like, like the pressure, like the media, like the audience, like whatever. So I was just in this feeling, in this flow, in this tunnel. And uh, this also kind of visualization um, of all the skills like com uh, combined with the feeling of it. So it was a really complex thing um, with like the gymnastics training and the mental training. Do you have still something else in your mind, Alexandra? Yes, I think I could ask for hours, <laughs> um, but I would also be interested um i in my uh, presentation i um was talking about a study that nicely showed that where you look you also land and i was at least if you do a dismount from the from the bars for example and i was wondering whether you had experienced such kind of um learning methods also in your career that coaches um, pointed out to you that you need to land further away and it didn't work out for example and then they told you to fixate that spot and then it worked out or a similar experiences would you um, support this finding that uh, at least from the more theoretical part some researchers found or also with gymnasts but um yeah i would be interested in i never experienced it like like that exactly because i think in gymnastics it's really difficult always to land on the same spot so uh because you have so many movements and whenever you have your shoulder a little bit more to the back or to the front you're flying to this direction or you're flying to this direction so of course we knew if we uh if we make the the technique perfectly usually i have to land in this area that was that was the thing we were working with um but more for like correcting the technique so whenever i did my dismount on high bar we knew the perfect technique and the perfect landing spot for me is exactly the place where the where the straps are going into the ground so we knew this distance is for me to my body to my height to everything the perfect spot so we worked with that in uh, in combination of the correction of the technique and sometimes, of course, we, we made a, a cross on the mat for that so that I exactly knew when I did the landing, okay, that was perfectly or that uh, was a little bit too early or too late. Um, so it's, it's hard in gymnastics to land really on this spot just because you're looking at this. The technique has to be perfect to land on this spot. And then you can, of course, see it and you, knew, and you know that it's a perfect landing. 
that was something that I was wondering during Alexandra's presentation when there was about the, the variation of, of the, the visual cues. And I was thinking back back again on my own career, and then I remember exactly as Fabian that it was like the, the exact spot for the, the good landing, plus minus 20 centimeters maybe, the distance. But then I was thinking that is there a way that we can also work to increase the variation so that we we tolerate more mistakes in a way? Or do we try to stabilize it in the, the, the perfect, uh, perfect technical execution and then this is something I don't know, Alexandra, but you say that the, the research field says that the variation might be a good way to, to pick things up. So what is your thought on this? Um, I think movement variability is uh, absolutely normal for every single skill. And there is no one centimeter uh, spot that you will always land at. There is always some variation and variation of a couple centimeters will not um, make a difference in terms of quality. But um, what I was actually uh, hinting at was that research actually showed that with um, manipulating your fixation, your gaze, you can actually change the technique. Instead of telling the person to change the technique, actually tell the person to look at a different spot and this will change the following movement. Like in the handstand, looking at your hands or looking through your arms to some distant wall or putting your head back and you have an arch in your upper body right away. So this kind of direct uh, link between eye and head movement and the upper body, for example, and that sometimes coaches use this kind of um, yeah, method to, to yeah, support, but also guide the eye movements. And this then will result in a changing technique. So I was actually wondering if such uh, methods have been used before also in your, um, in your own experience or with others maybe even. I didn't use that, but I think it could be really interesting to work on this, especially on the trampoline with the kids. That you, as a coach, you might, you might know where is the perfect spot to land uh, on a mat. So you, you do huge circle, maybe a little bit bigger than, than usual. And then you have to tell the kids, do a front somersault, whatever, exactly land at this spot. That could be a good, uh, good thing that they learn how to control the power they have to use to have a good coordination of, of the body position and everything that could be, could be really interesting and uh, it's worth it to, to try, um, definitely. But I didn't, didn't use it like that. It was just the other way around, as I, as I told before, that we worked on a technique and then we knew, okay, I will land on the perfect spot. So, uh, but still, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's difficult uh, on, the, on the events, like on, uh, on parallel bars, on high bar, on, on rings. There are so many different uh, factors which can influence the, the position of your landing and you can still land perfectly. You just know how, you just need to know how to behave in the air, when to open earlier, later, whatever. Um, and that's all up to the, to the good coordination, which is also dependent on, uh, on the visualization where you look at and where you uh, exactly know, okay, that was maybe a little bit too early. You don't have enough rotation. It's always a, a, a game, a, a combination of, uh, of different aspects. So um, I think as a coach, you should uh, try to figure all the different things out and, and see what's uh, working best with the kids. Well, exactly. And like Alexandra said before, that it would be topic for hours of discussion and to have the chat. But un unfortunately, we, we're running out of time for today. So it's time to thank you, our expert. My warmest thank you to our expert, Alexandra. Thank you. And to our guest, Fabian. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yanni. So this concludes the second series of the FIG online seminars. Make sure to subscribe on the FIG YouTube education channel. And please give your feedback during the, the YouTube comment, comment possibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.